You may not believe it at first, but there are 96 million black balls floating around in a water reservoir near Los Angeles. Hey, count them! Nah, it's not a crazy world record attempt or a scene from a blockbuster movie. These plastic spheres, also known as shade balls, have become an integral part of the reservoir system. So what are these shade balls, you ask? Well, they're just small plastic balls partially filled with water, which can float on the surface of reservoirs or lakes. Initially called bird balls, they were introduced to keep birds away from these bodies of water. But these little objects turned out to be multi-talented and started serving various other purposes, too. Now picture this. Each shade ball is about 4 inches in diameter and weighs up to 9 ounces. They're made of the same stuff as milk bottles, high-density polyethylene. To protect them from the sun's harmful UV rays, they add carbon black to make them rock a trendy black color. Surprisingly, despite being budget-friendly at just 36 cents per ball, they're expected to save over $200 million for the Los Angeles Department of Water. Not too shabby, right? Now, let's talk about their superpowers. These shade balls are true water-saving heroes. The primary purpose is to slow down evaporation, and the black ones are the stars of the show when it comes to water conservation. Not only do they reduce evaporation, but they also keep algae growth in check and prevent those nasty UV radiation byproducts from contaminating the water. But wait, there's more! These shade balls also are saving the day when it comes to bird aircraft collisions. Airports have these fancy retention basins, which are basically small lakes with water and vegetation. They're designed to collect excess rainwater and prevent flooding. Now the problem is, they also attract birds and other airborne critters, posing a risk to aircraft safety. So, enter the shade balls. By covering the surface of these basins, they make sure that the birds don't crash into any parties, protecting both their feathered lives and the airplanes. Now, you might think these balls were released into the LA reservoir to shield the water from the scorching California sun and reduce evaporation. And that's true, but there's more to the story. You see, the water in the reservoir contains bromide, a harmless mineral found in salt water. The catch is, when bromide meets sunlight, it undergoes a chemical reaction that produces bromate, quite a troubling substance which can be harmful to people. So to dial down this unwanted reaction, they decided to block out the sun with shade balls. Clever, huh? Now, before you go investing in your own shade ball project at home, you may want to do some investigating first, though. A study suggests that these shade balls might use more water than they save. Sure, in their years of existence, they saved a lot of water. As it turns out, making these balls requires water and lots of it. So, to enjoy a net water savings, the shade balls must float in the reservoir from one and a half to two years. Meanwhile, Los Angeles plans to replace them every 10 years. So, that works. Now, you have to agree, civil engineers do come up with some of the most creative ideas to help solve problems in all our communities. But some of these projects go down in history, and rightfully so, because of their impact. Take the Channel Tunnel, for instance. Fancy connecting the UK and continental Europe with an undersea tunnel? There's no need to fetch your swimming gear. This marvelous construction opened its doors, or rather tunnels, back in May 1994 after six years of development. When it was inaugurated, it became the longest undersea tunnel in the entire world. Picture this, the Channel Tunnel is like a family of tunnels, with three of them running side by side. The trains cruise through the two larger tunnels, while a smaller one, kind of like the younger sibling, is reserved for ventilation and access. One interesting thing about these constructions is they don't just go straight ahead like your average tunnel. They like to have a little fun. They curve and twist gently, going up and down or left and right. Why, you ask? Well, it's all because they want to gracefully glide through the chalky layers beneath the sea. On average, these tunnels are 148 feet below the seabed. Let's talk dimensions, too. The two larger tunnels measure 25 feet in width. That's tall and wide enough to welcome a double-decker bus, which turns out to be quite spacious enough for an underwater tunnel, don't you think? When the larger tunnels decide to join forces, think of it as a railway rendezvous. They meet up at two underwater hotspots called crossovers. These crossovers are not your ordinary train stations. They're grand undersea caverns. 
Now here's a geography lesson for you. The UK and France may be only 21 miles apart from their closest point, but these tunnel marvels stretch 35 miles in total. They make their way to the terminals inland at Folkestone and Calais, making sure no one misses the tunnel fun. The Channel Tunnel also changed the game when it comes to travel. Before this marvelous invention, hopping from London to Paris would take a tedious 6 or 7 hours by rail and ferry. Thanks to the tunnel, trains can now zip through the journey in just two and a half hours. Now, dig this. <laughs> the real digging kicked off in 1988 with some serious tunneling action. Some gigantic tunnel boring machines, or TBMs, were the stars of the show for this particular part of the project. Five of those mighty TBMs dug from France, while six others went to work from the UK. The TBMs decided to start their digging expedition with the service tunnel. You know why? It was all for the engineer to get a good feel for the ground conditions they were dealing with. Also, the crossover caverns were constructed using access from the service tunnels. The TBMs would venture through these caverns, only to dive back into the chalky depths to continue their epic excavation. Building these routes was also an amazing example of international cooperation. Turns out that the ground conditions on the French side were a bit damper compared to the British end. This meant the French TBMs had to take things a bit slower, while their British counterparts dug away to make up the difference. Meanwhile, the Hoover Dam is an equally impressive piece of civil engineering. It's as tall as a 60-story building and, back in 1935, when its construction finished, it proudly claimed the title of the world's tallest dam. And get this, its base is as thick as two football fields placed side by side. The resources used were also impressive. The amount of concrete those engineers needed to build the dam was so massive that it could have paved a road stretching all the way from San Francisco to New York City. But they built a dam with it. Now, consider its spillways. These nifty inventions are designed to handle overflow smoothly without causing any harm to the dam. They can manage an incredible amount of water, equivalent to what pours over Niagara Falls. But why did it need to be so big? Well, it had the mighty task of holding back the largest man-made lake in the United States, both then and now. If something went wrong, water would cover an area the size of the state of Connecticut by 10 feet. Now that's something you'd never want to experience. Hoover Dam has truly lived up to its expectations and then some. It's a superhero when it comes to protecting Southern California and Arizona from those infamous floods that used to plague the Colorado River. Not only that, it also provides much-needed water for irrigating those vast farm fields. And let's not forget about the power it generates, supplying water and electricity to cities like Los Angeles in the Southwest.